Capcom set their sights on making a remake of one of the first horror experiences and ended up making a whole new genre, the survival horror game. And with it, ended up selling 2.75 million copies. Capcom and Shinji Mikami then asked, well, how does one catch lightning in a bottle a second time? The answer? Give the sequel to another director. After popularizing what was thought to be a very niche genre, Shinji Mikami decided to not direct the sequel, believing that people already knew his scares, so it would be better if someone else directed the sequel. So, enter the doubling of staff at Capcom Production Studio 4 and the direction of Hideki Kamiya. And here starts the tug and pull that was the production of Resident Evil 2. Mikami wanted to make the game a bit more action-packed, but still retain that horror touch. Kamiya, well... If you know him from his more recent works, isn't much of a guy for subtlety. Restraint really isn't his strong suit. But somehow, Mikami and Kamiya were able to make a worthy sequel to Resident Evil. Hype was at its highest as screenshots and gameplay was shown off. But still, something felt, well, off. Mikami thought it was, well, kind of boring, and didn't really tie in too well with the first game. Gotta have those connections, so... People who played the first one could relate to the second one. Well, the thing is that the original plot for this game had Leon S. Kennedy as a rookie cop trying to escape Raccoon City, and Elza Walker, who was this college student, who was this cool biker girl on vacation coming back home. The two character campaigns didn't really interact with each other, so he did something that was really unheard of in the modern gaming industry at least. He requested a do-over, even though the game was supposed to be released in the next three months and was practically done. And he actually got it, partially because the original was still being released on different platforms and with different versions and still did pretty well. Also because what would latter be called Resident Evil 1.5, just like the original, was to be the last of the Resident Evil saga and so featured new protagonists. Mikami said that Chris and Jill had already been through this so well it wouldn't be really scary for those characters anymore and thus by extension the players. And after a whole lot of revisions Resident Evil 2 was released almost two years after the release of the original and it scared the bejeebus out of people. Resident Evil 2 is an improvement to that of Resident Evil 1 in almost every single way possible. And those improvements start from the very beginning. Resident Evil 2. <laughs> the Resident Evil that plays when you hit the start button is a lot less human. Augmented and almost alien, it, it's been put through so many post-process effects, it's very unnerving. This is even accentuated by the fact that if you had the DualShock version, which was the version that I played this moment, was also the very first jump scare of the game, and it got me. The game starts off and what happens at the beginning depends on what character you're playing as and what scenario it is. And that's kind of cool thing about this game. The first game had two different campaigns, but they were, for the most part, offered the same stuff. Anyways, the game starts off with Leon S. Kennedy, rookie copies on his first day on the job, who then encounters the living dead. He bumps into one Claire Redfield sister to Chris Redfield. They then try to flee to the safety of the police station only to be separated by a 1-2 zombie trucker punch. The two are separated and must make their way to the safety of the police station or at least what they thought was safe depending on who you start with. Depends on where the story goes. So we're going to going with what Capcom later claimed was the canon story. Claire first and Leon second. So upon reaching the PlayStation and greeted by this awesome little tune and little else,
The station is empty, so you go inside the only door that, to find out that the station had been attacked. So just like the first game, RE2 involves exploring a central location, looking for survivors, discovering its secrets, and getting the heck out of there. To me, finding more about the police station and its police chief was more interesting than some old spooky mansion. Probably because spooky mansions are this kind of tired trope by now. And for me, I had no idea about what the story was about in RE2 before I started playing, so everything was a nice surprise. All of the cutscenes in this one are a lot more cinematic and are generally better acted. The acting is still bad, but it's not that sitcom comedy level of the first game. Resident Evil 2 is also more busy in its story. While the first game could be summed up with, yo, don't mess with genetics, this one makes the familiar city settings dangerous and scary. Raccoon City, even though a small city in the Midwest, could be any city in America or even the world. Putting the horror outside of a big lofty mansion and into the city kind of really grounds the game. The police station, which is normally a symbol of safety, is actually really dangerous. That's really how this game amplifies the horror this time around. There's also actual character arcs in this one. Leon in his first day on the job as a police officer feels the need to protect as a police officer is wont to do. And learns that, well, not to trust everyone and that he can't save everyone. Claire Redfield, who came to Raccoon City looking for her brother, ended up becoming a protector in her own sorts, in contrast to Sherry Birkin's actual parents, who were workaholics and always concerned about their work. Then you have the police chief, who actually in his past was accused of rape a couple times, but got away with it because he's a good student. Now he's a corrupt police chief who's now shooting the very people he's supposed to protect. Actually, now that I think of it, with all the these previous statement there seems to be a strong safety motif in this game if you consider everything together really interesting that the game has actually a lot more going on than the first game gameplay wise the game is very similar to the first game except in this one there are more weapons and there are more actual weapon upgrades there are also more zombies on the screen but at times, you'll have more ammo than normal. You're now able to tell at a glance an estimation of how much health you have by how your character is holding themselves. Holding their stomach, but still walking fine for now. Just take a green herb, you'll be fine. Yeah, but you know, holding your stomach but limping along, well, you're gonna need some serious medical attention. The whole gameplay of exploring rooms, gathering materials, and deciding how to use said materials are as strong here, or probably even stronger because in this one, you don't have to backtrack across long distances. Typically there's shortcuts that get you back to where you need to be in a reasonable amount of time. And the puzzles that you need to backtrack for aren't really hard at all, except really these box puzzles which involve climbing. The only problem I have is that the game doesn't really let you know too well that you could climb those boxes. A system that's supposed to be new in the game is something that is inspired by Back to the Future Part 2, which is the zapping feature. What happens is that something that character A does affects what happens in the B scenario. In the clearest example, you come upon this locker and you have the choice to either pick up a machine gun or a pack to make your storage capacity lar larger. It's a really interesting choice because, well, choosing the machine gun takes up two spaces, but... The side pack also gives you two more spaces. So you could pick up one or the other, or both, actually, if you're feeling like a dick. And whatever is left in this locker is left for the other character. But it really doesn't get used like that anywhere else in the game. Well, except for this door where you have to register the, register the two th characters' thumbprints to get in the door. But that's kind of really it. All that really matters is who you start the game off with. That's what really makes the game so interesting, because essentially there's it's the same game four times, but not really, because you got different puzzles and different scenarios that play out, especially in the B-plot, because, well, this guy starts following you throughout the game. He shows up in your second playthrough. Trenchy is supposed to cover up everything for Umbrella, so yeah, he's a, he's a thing. He's pretty scary when he shows up. On top of the four different scenarios, you've got different unlocks. You could unlock and play through the game with a submachine gun, Gatling gun, infinite rocket launcher, alternate costumes. I, I kind of find it funny that Leon's biker outfit is more accurate biker outfit than Claire's. I mean, if you're gonna ride your bike cross country, you've got to consider the case that you might have an accident. And in that case, it might turn out that the real zombies are 
coming at you at speeds over one mile per hour. Someone's gonna eat her skin, like like zombies. You know, zombies eat skin, and um, they're they're flesh eating. And <laughs> hey, I'm trying. I'm sorry. It's just hard to follow up the joke from last time. But hey, you know how about March Madness? Gotta get your bracket together. Oh, wow, that's a that's gonna uh, that's gonna date this video a lot. Um, I'm just gonna stop right here. In addition to that is the extreme battle mode, which kind of serves as this prototype for mercenaries mode, except in this mode you have a specific objective that you must complete. On top of that, there's this side story thing, which is supposed to, with this character called Hunk, who's supposed to be an umbrella soldier trying to escape Raccoon City, and well, there's also the best side mode to ever exist. <clears throat> tofu Survivor stars a piece of tofu stuck behind enemy lines who must escape a city full of brain dead husks who want to a piece of his soft white bean curdy body. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, okay, what am I kidding? Like, what is this? Anyways, it's just the hunk mission again, but with a piece of tofu who only has a knife, only to be rewarded with just being eaten. I wonder if this is canon. Resident Evil 2 is considered by many fans of the older games to be the best Resident Evil game, for good reason. And in almost every aspect it is better than the original, but I just find it less iconic for that matter. People like to mention how the graphics are better than the original, like how each screen of the pre-rendered backgrounds took around three weeks to render, but certain little things like the dumbed-down puzzles and the fact that objects are no longer 3D renders kind of really don't get mentioned. I mean, they're really small things, but I mean, come on. RE2 is still a great game that's worth playing and replaying over and over again uh, to try to unlock all of its secrets, which really makes me really interested if a remake of RE2 would do the same as it did for RE1, because that means I get to see Tofu Survivor in all its tofu-ness in HD. That would be great.